Welcome back to Austin P. State University for our final lecture for the art of theater, introduction to theater. Today I'm going to try to cover 150 years of musical theater in one lecture, so wish me luck. I usually break this up into a couple lectures if it's a regular classroom, so if we move a little fast today, I apologize. Um, uh, so Many of you have probably heard of Broadway. There I am there seeing Cyrano de Bergerac on Broadway. Um, if we look at it literally, Broadway is a street in New York City. Uh, you may have seen the ball drop in Times Square on New Year's. That is in the theater district. Now, New York City is not the only place with a theater district. Most major cities have an area where a lot of the theaters are, just like there's an art district or Chinatown. A lot of big cities traditionally have a theater district. But Broadway is by far the most popular one across the world. 42nd Street, as you may have heard before, and the famous song, uh, but the, it's a set of streets, it's an area, and of course they run perpendicular to Broadway, which is just the name of a street, traditionally the broadest street in town. So you, whatever city you're in right now, you probably have a broad street. Um, that's a very popular name for a street. In Broadway, in New York City, it's not considered a Broadway show unless it has over a thousand seats. So we're talking big spectacle. We're talking um, Coliseum, kind of larger than life sounds there. Sorry, that buzz on my phone. Um, uh, so if it's smaller than a thousand seats, it's called off-Broadway, and it's usually a little farther off the beaten path, and those tend to be the quirkier shows we were talking about last week, or musicals who are working their way up to Broadway. Uh, Broadway tickets are really expensive nowadays, and they talk about that in the last part of your book. Um, you can't really see a Broadway show for under $75 these days. Uh, they're really, really pricey, um, but I think you get what you pay for in many cases. Um, Broadway is the U.S.'s biggest tourist attraction by far. People come from all over the world to come see an American Broadway musical. Um, and it pays off. As you can see, uh, these uh, big musicals, you've probably heard of some of them, Lion King, Wicked, they make a lot of money. So it is a gamble. You can lose a lot of money on a musical, but you can also make a lot of money on a musical. So, so um, what is exactly a musical? Uh, so we, in theater, we have what we call straight plays. That has nothing to do with uh, sexuality. Straight play means it doesn't have much singing in it. Uh, it's just a straight musical. I mean, a straight uh, play without songs. And then there's an opera, which would be the other side of the continuum. Opera, everything is sung. There are no words uh, that aren't sung. Um, so then we had burlesque, and burlesque was sort of making fun of opera. Uh, you can see this picture here is really easy to make fun of, right? Opera is extravagant, it's melodramatic, and so burlesque was a way for um, poor people in general to parody opera and make fun of it. it usually involved some form of stripping. Uh, if you go to New Orleans now, you can see a burlesque show where they strip down to, um, you know, their underwear. It's not full nudity, but uh, those are traditionally have a little bit of story on them and they're usually making fun traditionally of opera. Um, and then kind of operetta, if it's on the continuum, it's a little bit closer to opera than a straight play or a musical. Operetta is also making fun of opera, sort of a light-hearted uh, form with some talking in it. Uh, you probably, the most famous operetta you may have heard of is Pirates of Penzance or anything by Gilbert and Sullivan. I am the very model of a modern major general, right? And it's kind of uh, lighthearted, a little less serious than opera. And that brings us to the musical. The musical was an outgrowth of the British operetta. 
and it is once again an American art form all right so there are all these types of musicals and I'll take just a moment to step you through them we're on page 264 in your book so a musical comedy is how musicals started light-hearted joking but the modern musical is can be dramatic particularly the Sondheim musicals that have risen to popularity that we'll talk about later a review doesn't necessarily have a plot it's just a series of songs um, sung in one play so a rock musical uh, is just like it sounds it it has rock music in the musical um, particularly jukebox musicals are really popular nowadays jukebox musicals often just cover um, the songs of one artist and it's sort of a way for people to relive you know uh, Jersey Boys is probably the most famous jukebox musical uh, ABBA has a jukebox musical Mamma Mia it's a way for them to enjoy the music of their era with a story kind of loosely bringing those things together um, dance musicals uh, it's just any kind of musical where dance is more emphasized than the music itself I would argue Cats is a dance musical chorus line which we'll talk about later um, any Fosse musical like Chicago or uh, you know there's lots of dance musicals out there where you're going to see the dancing more than anything else and then we have musicals that are still sort of in the operatic style we still expect to see um, women hit these really high notes or show big emotion I would argue that a lot of Andrew Lloyd Webber plays are operatic musicals particularly Phantom of the Opera which we'll talk about a little bit more so when I, we talk about musicals some of you will tend to think of this picture we have on the uh, screen here you think of singing in the rain or how to succeed in business without really trying tap dancing jazz hands and that is the traditional American musical but um, there are so many types of musicals out there that it uh, it's more diverse genre than some people might initially think of all right so we're on page 267 and uh, we're starting with one of my favorite musicals which is Sweeney Todd you may be familiar with the movie version that came out recently with Johnny Depp uh, Angela Lansbury has a really great version too uh, from the 80s if you ever want to check that out sometime um, so this is uh, Stephen Sondheim wrote this musical and it is a great example of the diversity of musical theater uh, it is a horror story uh, Stephen Sondheim likes to kind of dip his hands in all kinds of stories and then this one it is about a barber um, the demon barber of Fleet Street he comes back he's been falsely imprisoned he comes back to seek revenge on the man who falsely imprisoned him he in the meantime kills lots of people and cooks them into meat pies uh, so it's a really twisted story um, Sondheim if you go to see a Sondheim play you have to expect disturbing plots right such as eating people uh, the cynical tone about life in general um, you know I saw a beautiful Sondheim musical recently called merrily we roll along and uh, it is not about a group of friends who merrily roll along <laughs> it is about a group of friends who fall out and lose touch completely and it's told from the last scene to the first scene and so they kind of start with this um, negativity about life and then at the we get back to the beginning of the story and it's all smiles and the hope for the future and so uh, Stephen Sondheim in general is going to be cynical he's going to tell you tongue-in-cheek kind of skeptically his view of the world he's very much a New Yorker that way um, the plots are usually uh, well this one is borrowed Sweeney Todd it's based on Mac the knife it's based on a straight play um, but the music is very intricate in fact if you go to an audition they ask you not to bring in a piece of Stephen Sondheim's music because it is 
it tends to be more operatic. It tends to be more intricate. The harmonies, the um, patter, which is a kind of operetta style. Uh, pardon me, is everybody there? Because if everybody's there, I'd like to thank you all for coming to the wedding. It's really fast. You've probably heard it before. Um, and so those sort of mature kinds of music are harder to do at an audition, for example. As I said, he broadened what an American musical could be. We can have these stories about murderers or Into the Woods, which is sort of a fairy tale spin-off where everything goes twistedly awry. Um, assassins, uh, which is about what it sounds like. It's about assassins. So uh, he was able to turn the musical into something dark or different and not just an entertainment. Um, so as we kind of continue in defining what is a musical, as I said, it's a continuum. Any play is a continuum. Uh, you may have noticed in Midsummer Night's Dream, as you're currently working on your character analysis, that there are a few songs in Midsummer Night's Dream that are meant to be sung. Now, we would think of Shakespeare as a straight play, but obviously there were songs going on. You know, Aristotle, as we covered his elements, music was one of the elements uh, or diction. Um, you know, he presumably heard some sort of music in these Grecian chants. Uh, the Moliere and the masks of France were very intricate and beautiful, um, you know, pre-opera kind of things going on. So music is nothing new in the theater. We don't mean to say that Americans were the first people to think, hey, we should put music in this play, but um, the distinct musical theater genre is an American contribution and it's only been around for about 150 years. Perhaps the most telling side of American musical where it was really was born was in bars in vaudeville. We talked about this a little bit in chapter three when we talked about the history of African American theater. Um, vaudeville was a way to make people laugh. Think about um, Charlie Chaplin, uh, Buster Keaton, some of these early silent film stars were very much in the style of vaudeville. I have a picture of Singing in the Rain here, if you've ever seen that musical. That's uh, a very famous scene of them performing in a vaudeville uh, kind of environment. So they were mixed entertainments. Uh, there were some acts that were singing, some were juggling, some were doing what we call slapstick or physical comedy. Um, some were female impersonators, right? Uh, especially here in Tennessee, we have some very famous vaudevillian acts that were touring across the country. Um, with the invention of the railroads, we were able to take these acts on the road. And a lot of Nashville musicians um, were kind of, if you think hee-haw sort of humor, uh, toured around the country. And if you go to the Nashville airport, they have statues erected in the honor of some of these vaudevillian performers who played the fiddle, who uh, did um, kind of... Uh, musical comedy, if you will. Many of the uh, vaudevillian acts were kind of close to skin shows. They had a lot of girls scantily clad. Uh, an example of this is Ziegfeld's Follies. If you've ever seen um, a bunch of women in the exact same costume standing in a kick line with uh, high heels on. They are very much in the tradition of Ziegfeld Follies. Ziegfeld um, had these big beautiful feather headdresses and these elaborate beaded costumes and the women would all look the same and uh, move completely in unison. It was very impressive. Um, uh, if you've ever seen the musical Funny Girl, uh, made popular by Barbara Streisand, uh, th that was set within the context of Ziegfeld's Follies. So, as we talked about in Chapter Three, there were the minstrel shows, which were often um, poking fun at African Americans, people in blackface. But I won't belabor that point since we already talked about it in Chapter Three. 
Um, uh, many of the early movies were set in vaudeville. So, as I said, this is Singing in the Rain. Um, but some of those Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin movies kind of centered around vaudeville. The closest thing we have to vaudeville nowadays would be American Idol or Saturday Night Live. Uh, the tradition of competition and each person having kind of their own act or sketch. It's very similar to the vaudeville experience. Also, you know, vaudeville was very rowdy audience. People would clap or boo or throw things at the stage. It was very interactive that way. So that's kind of another way it's like American Idol. I mean, nobody's texting their answers in, but it definitely, the way that you either succeeded or failed in vaudeville was based on your audience reaction. And you have to remember most of them were fairly drunk. All right, so the first Broadway musical, what we think of today as an American musical. We are on page 271. I kind of skipped over some of the opera stuff. Like I said, I'm trying to cover all this in one lecture. But um, is the Black Crook. The Black Crook. Um, so the story is about a guy who makes a deal with the devil. And the guy has a crooked back, which is where the word crook comes from. Um, and as we, uh, he kind of makes a deal with the devil. So if you've ever uh, seen or heard of Dr. Faustus, the very famous uh, Renaissance play, uh, it's that same theme of making a deal with the devil. And uh, what uh, for every person he delivers to hell, he gets another year added to his life. So it's kind of a spooky spooky play but what actually made the play so successful and so different how this was different from the other vaudevillian acts is that a school nearby burned down and so all of the Parisian ballet ballerinas came and performed in Black Crook so this was the first time we kind of have musical um, dancers we have a chorus line included in a regular straight play and it blew up it became so so popular people came from all around um, it was very much an emphasis on their bare arms and their bare legs uh, that was part of its selling point so it was kind of a skin show and I would argue that a lot of Broadway still has an element of sex in it um, there's almost all the musicals except kids shows are gonna have um, pretty women scantily clad it's still a big element of musical theater um, I don't want to get too heavy into kind of this tirade about religion being against the theater um, uh, but this play once it started earning money it started many businessmen changed their mind about theater it started to more people started putting money into the theater um, before the theater was kind of looked at as something that was going on in bars you know something that wasn't a, f a responsible financial investment uh, you know musical theater was seen as skin shows but after this theater kind of blew up many backers kind of came back into the theater now it was always respectable I say always it was respectable in the 1850s for you to go see a Shakespeare play but musicals would have been associated with bars so um, but the black crook kind of opened the door for financial investors from white Protestant men which before um, musical theater was much more of a lower class endeavor um, as I said uh, American tourist activity you know Broadway brings in 12 million dollars in a year I mean just an insane amount of money going in now that's nothing compared to film but um, it's still a lot for any kind of art form so it is very much a product of New York and America it is a melting pot uh, 
and you can say a lot of it is because of where it is in New York City. There is a high population of immigrants at this time in the 1850s. Uh, the immigration laws were very loose and we had lots of people pouring into one city and mixing their uh, different kinds of uh, traditions together. Almost all of the early American, well, for that matter, still today, Sondheim, a lot of the writers are Jewish. Uh, Ross, Oscar and Hammerstein, uh, Sondheim, you know, these guys almost were all Jewish. And uh, part of that is because Judaism has a big honoring of music in their religion. And a lot of the um, ways that we hear songs harmonize and um, the traditions of the musical theater are similar to the traditions of the Jewish church. There's a little bit of bleed over there. Uh, Fiddler on the Roof was the first actual Jewish musical and it was a big deal for a lot of Jewish composers because so often they had to kind of hide their identity because their ethnicity wasn't respected. You know, White Christmas Irving Berlin was not celebrating Christmas <laughs> uh, but he was writing um, these to, for commercial success, obviously. Um, you know, the African American experience is definitely part of American Broadway, the jazz element um, that came out of the bars, that came out of um, blues in the South. You know, those elements for sure are part of what people think of as the American musical. Um, Irish cloggers, right, that obviously turned into tap dancing. English operettas, which we already talked about. And then all of that happened in bars. That lower class sort of mixing of people created this art form. It definitely was born in bars. Um, and then once I said after uh, rich people started to see that it, there was money to be made, they started investing in the theater. But um, it is very much a product of the melting pot. So... Um, the first kind of age, like I said, it was born around the 1850s, but then the first sort of coming into its own was definitely at the turn of the century. Um, George and Ira Gershwin were brothers, uh, and they were very, very successful. Um, you may have heard White Christmas. Uh, uh, Kern is another great American composer. Cole Porter is probably my favorite from this era. Um, he did Anything Goes. In olden days a glimpse of stocking was looked on as something shocking, but heaven knows anything goes. It was very, um, ba -da -da, you know, lots of jazz hands, uh, strolling piano, heartwarming entertainments, light entertainments. Um, so, of course, it was very spectacle-oriented. They were all about creating these elaborate costumes and um, these special effects. Uh, Aristotle would not have approved of this era of musical comedy. It was not as emphasized on the story, right? The story, eh, give it or take it, right? A lot of it was just a story about young people falling in love, or some sort of patriotic story where they're saluting the troops. Um, remember, this is an age of uh, unrest politically. Most of the characters were stereotypes or archetypes. Um, you know, like I said, we have our young lovers, we have our body lady making body jokes. Uh, they were not deep, meaningful complicated characters. Um, so when we talk about the kind of plot structure that was going on here, there wasn't much of a plot and even if there were it was usually just a way to string the famous songs together. So often the way that the composers would do this um, is they would take a popular song and they would hand it to a uh, somebody that would get different actors and say hey what songs have you got worked up okay that's your act right now let's see if we can kind of string these acts together 
So they would take those soloists and sort of put dialogue between the two, but it was really just a way to connect the plot. For example, in Anything Goes, there's Reno Sweeney and she has her girl dancers and they're on a boat and she's friends with a guy named Billy who's falling in love, but pretty much all of her songs in the uh, nightclub are nightclub performances. So it's presumably a woman who already had these nightclub show acts that got together with um, a librettist to create sort of a book musical based on the music that they already had. So just think of it as a little bit of dialogue, stop of the plot, do a little dance, dialogue picks back up, we get a little more plot, stop the plot, do a little dance and song, and so on and so forth. So the process for getting those together was actor-centric rather than writer-centric. And whether the writing came together, once again, if you've ever seen White Christmas, you know, there's a little bit of love going on there, but sisters, sisters, right? It's really just about them performing their songs, and there's a little bit of dialogue in between. So, all of that changed, came to a screeching halt with Showboat. Showboat absolutely redefined what musical theater is or could be. Perhaps the most um, interesting thing about Showboat and its success was the fact that it was a mixed race cast, that there were black people and white people performing on stage together. Now, as it says in your book, this did not happen overnight. There was a white woman in blackface. There were a few very stereotypical characters, but for the most part, it was a respectful telling of the African American experience as compared with other um, sort of minstrel shows at the time. And not only that, it was an interracial relationship. So that was really. Uh, really uh, different. It had a complex plot. It wasn't just about, uh, you know, two people falling in love. There were lots of nuances in the story. My favorite song from this, and probably the most recognizable, is Old Man River, He Don't Do Nothing. Sorry. <laughs> Forgive my interpretations of these. I'm just trying to give you a little idea of them. Um, But Oscar Hammerstein, of course, was the lyricist on this. And he later um, won a uh, Pulitzer Prize for a musical that he did with Kern. So that tells you what kind of writing was going on. It wasn't just um, smiling and jazz hands. Oscar and Hammerstein uh, was working with Jerome Kern. Uh, If you go to see this musical, it's really long, just to warn you, and the female parts are really high. That was kind of the operatic style of that time. So just beware if you're thinking about mounting showboat in your local theater, you got to have a girl who can sing really, really high. But that's really true of all of the plays of this period. Um, you know, Pirates of Penzance, Mabel has to sing, oh man, so, so high. That's just part of the operatic style of the time. Um, so now we get into the golden age of musicals. Uh, you know, in the 1920s, there are theaters opening everywhere and uh, we start getting into musical dramas such as um, Porgy and Bess. Of course we have the stock market crash of 1929 so a lot of the more serious themes going on in stories result in kind of this more sophisticated uh, culture where where people are confronting their pain a little bit more. Um, There were some political plots uh, that were going on that were more critical of the government as opposed to just this sort of celebration of our troops. 
one thing that happened that uh, was new is that the dancing and the music would continue the plot. So when um, Rodgers and Hammerstein wrote Oklahoma, this was the first play where story happened during the songs. It was no longer just going to actors and getting their different acts and kind of stringing them together with some dialogue between songs. Oscars and Hammerstein wrote this music to have plot progression during the songs. Um, most famously in Oklahoma she has a dream sequence, a ballet, and uh, you know we can see a whole story that's told just through the movements of the ballet scene. This is very different. Um, once again big success. Rodgers and Hammerstein pack the houses with their sentimental stories. Um, the uh, touring companies would go all over and uh, these were the songs that were on the radio. So when we think about gray hairs going to the theater and why some theaters are almost fully stocked of people who were older, part of that is because this was the music that was on the radio when they were young. So they enjoy going to the theater to hear those songs that were so successful. Um, it really wasn't until the invent of rock and roll in the late 50s that musical theater was not what was playing on the radio. Um, so the song and dance, once again, is what progresses the plot. Kind of got ahead of myself there. Kind of funny. Once again, it's a celebration of the American West. It's a celebration of rural life. Rogers and Hammerstein had never been out of New York. <laughs> they knew very little about rural life or westerns. They were uh, very much living, uh, you know, in the Jewish culture of New York City. Um, uh, but they wrote a wonderfully romantic version of what it must be like to live in the American West and it has become one of the great stories um, of the American experience. Oklahoma where the wind goes riding through the plains, right? Most of you guys have heard that before. Um, so uh, from 1950s onward we kind of get this diversification of the musical. Once rock and roll is introduced we kind of have a falling off of popularity for um, for musicals. Not nearly like today but uh, we have these choreographer directors like Chicago, like I said Bob Fosse, kind of writing this music uh, or telling these stories in order to dance. Dance was really what was very popular. Uh, West Side Story was very cutting edge for its time. It did a lot of things that were kind of new and different. I think I have the wrong page number there. I sure do. That's not even in the right chapter. Let's see. What page is this on? We're on page 278. Sorry for the typo there. Um, and this is where Stephen Sondheim got his start. He was uh, writing the the book for this one. Anyway, uh, so this is West Side Story. West Side Story is a musical that was new and different for many reasons. First of all, people were just wearing regular clothes. So there's not this emphasis on big elaborate costumes like there were with the Ziegfeld's Follies. They're just wearing their clothes you might have seen off the street. Um, it's based, the story is based on Romeo and Juliet. Um, so the Puerto Rican Maria falls in love with Polish Tony. So it's basically a story about gang warfare and them kind of overcoming. You probably have heard of the sharks and the jets. You can see them fighting down there uh, with their switchblades. Um, it was a big deal to talk about something as serious as interracial relationships. Remember interracial relationships at this time were still illegal. So um, it was definitely uh, a stylish show. Uh, you know, I just heard an interview, there's this great PBS documentary about musicals and Julie Taymor was talking about when she went to go see this she was like taking style tips from the 
the Broadway musical because it was so fresh and cutting edge. And a lot of that influenced today what modern musicals are. A lot of the more edgy musicals are very stylized and um, kind of cool for its time. So, and then of course it was turned into a blockbuster movie. Um, Chorus Line is a great example of a dancer musical, and it really reflects what was going on in the theater community. So in the 70s, as I said, with the invent of rock and roll, the musicals were really struggling. A lot of popularity of musicals were declining. New York City was becoming much more crime-ridden, much more uh, dangerous place to be. There were riots in the streets still, and so... Um, theaters as they tried to change the way that they were doing plays so that they could stay in business instead of hiring a whole slew of dancers to come and be the chorus line they had to ask the dancers to be triple threats to be people who could sing dance and act so in this story they're taking these dancers and trying to write a story for them so that they can act their way through it so it's kind of a musical about the evolution and change of musical theater at that time. Um, the premise of the story is how difficult auditioning or theater is in general. Um, you know, man, I hope I get it. I hope I get it. And they're all really, you know, thousands of people coming in to audition for this 12 spots, 8 spots. And... Um, it was kind of a story about the American dream and how difficult it is to succeed in New York City. You know, I really need this job. They're all doing their best and scraping by to try to be successful. So, um, 17 dancers in a straight line. If you see that, it's probably going to be chorus line. Perhaps the most famous song from this is uh, one singular sensation, every single step she takes, right? And the end of that is actually kind of sardonic. We kind of see how they're not just these identical people standing in a line. They're not nameless, faceless people. They kind of took the metaphor of the chorus line and turned it on its head. These are individuals. These are real people who have to work very hard to sort of create this continuity or togetherness. Um, but it's very much a dancer's musical. Uh, lots of tricks in the dancing. Lots of split leaps or difficult numbers of turns. Um, it is a dancer's musical. The Phantom of the Opera is here. <laughs> All right, very much a musical of the 80s. Uh, this is by Andrew Lloyd Webber. Um, it is part of the British invasion, not not the rock and roll British invasion, but the um, import invasion. So suddenly New York City is struggling financially. Um, the theater scene is struggling financially. So Andrew Lloyd Webber is a great um, British composer and a lot of his works start to be just kind of touring around the country and they spent a lot of time in New York City. Uh, some other great Andrew Lloyd Webber plays are Miss Saigon, Cats, a lot of these plays that are sort of synonymous with the 80s. Um, all of the, they were all imported from the West End in London. And once again, a lot of stolen, <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of ticket sales going to support these British actors. American actors were having trouble getting work, uh, just like the economy shifted and we started, uh, you know, building factories in Mexico. We also started importing our actors as well. Um, another thing that was kind of interesting that happened with all these British invasion musicals is their style of posters where they just kind of created this one iconic look. Uh, if you've ever seen Cat's poster, it's Cat Eyes, or Miss Saigon, it's just uh, that sunset. So some bold marketing that was more commercial than past marketing for theater had been. Um, during this uh, British invasion, there was always going to be a larger-than-life spectacle to try to get people in the door. Um, in Phantom of the Opera, it's a chandelier that falls. In Miss Saigon, it's a helicopter that lands on stage. You know, there's always going to be some really big, larger-than-life spectacle. 
And then, of course, the popularity of some of these films in the 80s, uh, or some of these musicals in the 80s, is because they were turned into major motion pictures. So there's sort of this... um, you know, relationship between film and theater. If someone has seen the film, they might be more likely to go see it in the theater because it's something that they've heard of. Um, But then also people may not want to go see it because it's something they've heard of. So a play like Hairspray is getting done a lot right now because there's a movie version of it. And so people are kind of familiar. Um, Oh, and particularly why that's important is because Phantom is still running successfully in the West End and in New York City, and I think part of it is because of the recent film version of it. So last musical I want to talk about today has more to do with a whole movement for New York City. Um, Beauty and the Beast was the first Disney musical to open back in New York, and Rudy Giuliani really cleaned up New York City. Um, and the theater district in particular. He kicked out the strip clubs. He, uh, as you probably may know with Rudy Giuliani, he got rid of a lot of the uh, graffiti and uh, the crime element in New York City with pretty drastic measures, and, and his methods were very controversial, but he definitely revitalized what it meant to be uh, in New York City. And we've definitely seen a revitalization of Broadway. Um, The commercial backers are now movie industry. So, um, you know, Wicked is supported by Universal Studios, but obviously The Lion King, Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, these are all put out by Disney. And there's all of these jokes in the theater communities about how the rat, that's what they call Mickey Mouse, uh, or Disney in general, the rat owns Broadway now. Um, But there's no doubt that it's breathed a lot of life back into the commercial theater of um, New York City. Right, we didn't have that family-friendly environment. If you had told someone in the 70s that you wanted to take your kid down to Broadway, uh, they would have looked at you like you were, you know, needed to be picked up by protective services because it was strip joints and liquor and and wild women. Um, but now Broadway has turned much more commercial. It's much more family-friendly. It's, um, you know, places where, for the most part, you feel safe taking your family. You know, now if you go to Times Square, there's a big M&M store, uh, you know, there's a big toy story, uh, a toy store. It's much more family friendly in Times Square than it used to be. All right, and as you can see there in the picture, uh, you may be familiar with the Beauty and the Beast story. Uh, Some of the costumes for that are really creative. And the way that they, you know, make the Little Mermaids on roller skates. There's a lot of really fun ways to bring those cartoons to life. And those cartoons, when they were written, they were written in the American Broadway musical style. So kind of putting them on stage was kind of an easy transition um, because they were already written in the style of the American Broadway musical. Um, So... Uh, hopefully I've successfully covered 150 years of theater history uh, when it comes to the American Broadway musical. I love musicals. I understand that it's a niche market and some of you um, may not uh, like musicals as much, Um, but I think that uh, it's a beautiful art form and it's by far the most successful art form in America. If you go to any community theater, most of them are going to be running um, American musical in the romantic, comedy, lighthearted way. Uh, So, thank you so much for listening to the last, what, 13, 14 lectures. Uh, I really appreciate you staying with me. I hope that you have learned a lot in this class, and uh, I wish you all the best on your final exam. Thank you for listening.